All right, so a very warm welcome to the live audience here. Uh, welcome to Chennai Storytelling Festival. Welcome to the session of stories for and by adults. We've had uh, 12 in the series and this is the 11th one, yeah. Um, welcome to everybody online. Uh, morning, evening, afternoon, early morning. Yes, hello everybody. Um, we're going to start the session as Eric was saying. It's a hybrid session today. So we have both live audiences and we have an audience coming in from all over the world. So we're going to start the session with uh, the first teller for the day. We have Divya Anand from Chennai. She's going to come and take the hot seat. Please Divya, come introduce yourself and share a story with us. Thank you, Pratigya, and uh, thank you, Eric, for this wonderful opportunity. And uh, thank you all for being here and online uh, tellers as well. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is a folk tale that I'm going to say, and let's jump straight in. Uh -huh. A long, long time ago, in Southeast Asia, there lived a king, King Tuman. He was a very wise and uh, a noble king, a very fair administrator. And uh, he would sit in his court and solve people's problems every day. Will you help me welcome King Tuman into his court, please? So, Raja Di Raja. Raja Matanda, Raja Gambir, Raja Tuman, Para, Para, Para. Now, I don't know the language of the land, so I have said this, and with the help of my friends in Tamil, we can Google translate this later. So um, he meted out justice to whoever would need that. And most importantly, he was well loved by all his subjects and um, the neighboring kings and princes as well. But sadly, King Tuman passed on and uh, the throne was taken by his son, King Sunan. Now, King Sunan was very different from his father. He was uh, stubborn and cranky and he was a bit ambitious. A bit of ambition is good, but when the bit becomes a byte and a megabyte and a gigabyte and lots and lots of bytes, that's an awful thing, you know, it's, it's a bad combination. Like uh, dosa and ketchup, French fries and mango jam. Ah, exactly, that's the reaction people would have when they thought of King Sunan. King Sunan was, he, his aim was only one, that he had to invade a lot of kingdoms and annex them. So he was waging wars left, right and center in all the neighboring villages and kingdoms. Now, King Sunan, through a grand ceremony for in his own honor of becoming the king. And uh, a lot of these kings and princes came to congratulate him. After all, he had inherited a lot of power as well from his father. So they came and congratulated him and they would come and plead with him. King Sunan, please, we beseech you. Don't wage any more wars on us. The land can't take it. I will give you rich taxes in rice and cattle and gold and whatever you may ask for. But please spare us of war. Uh, another king would go, I will stay under your patronage for my lifetime, King Sunan. Please do not wage a war on us. And King Sunan would sit on that mighty chair of his and say, oh. So then bow to me really, really low and say, uh, the king say, I have a back problem, your majesty. I have an L5-S1 problem. My physiotherapist has advised me not to bend too much. Otherwise, I would have literally prostrated at your feet. Then proclaim, King Sunan is the greatest, most powerful, supreme ruler in the whole wide world. Say it. Yes, a King Sunan is the greatest, a most powerful king. You left the word supreme out. A supreme ruler in the whole wide world. Uh, and if I find you scheming against me, 
your entire vertebral column will be at risk. Understood? Yes, your majesty, I did understand. You may go now. And that was how he treated his peers and contemporaries. Well, there were a lot of disgruntled people in King Sunan's kingdom. So one of the courtiers, he thought he had to do something about it. And he got hold of a scroll, scribbled something on it, and put but it along with the other scrolls that had come as congratulatory messages. You know, the kings and princes who couldn't be there in person, they had sent their congratulatory messages and wishes via scrolls. So this scroll also landed up in that bunch. And the prime minister started reading those scrolls one after the other. And when he handed, when he uh, picked up this particular scroll, opened it and read, he stared and stared back at King Sunan. And then his jaw dropped. King Sunan said, yes, prime minister, what is it? The prime minister, well, um, um, well, your majesty, um, oh, up, what is know. the matter? Oh, so he says him. that in the quotes. It's not it, It's not me who's saying it. Begin quotes. So you think you are the most powerful robber like your father? Sorry, ruler, bad handwriting, like your father? Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, you can never be so. And what more, you will never invade Selang. Oh, PTO. Very cold regards. King Hien of Selang, end quotes. That's it. King Sunan's eyes became red and he was seething with anger. That he and that impudent fellow, how dare he? We are going to wage a war on Selang. The prime minister rushed and said, Your majesty, please don't do this. It could have been a prank. Somebody would have, you know, played a trick of sorts. We will investigate. This is not wise. That was enough for him to declare war on a country like that, you know, provoke. So nothing could dissuade uh, King Soon and the prime minister said, you see, there are so many kings and kingdoms under us already. Why do we want to go on this Selang chase? No, no, no. You know, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush and all that. In fact, we don't even know whether there is a bush. So let's not go on this wild goose chase. No. Bush, you say? I will have the entire forest, minister. Let's set up a, a ship and let us sail to Selak. Well, he couldn't see any reason. So the prime minister again said, okay, fine, if that's what you have decided. But there is a teeny tiny issue. What issue is that? We don't know where Selang is. <laughs> Selang is? Well, um, I have heard my father say sometime that it's somewhere near the South Sea. So let's set sail. He called out to the general of the army. General, round up the elephants, the horses, the tigers. And... Tigers, your majesty? No, I got carried away. Elephants, horses, the infantry, the cavalry, the armory and everything. Arms, ammunition. Let's set sail to Selang. Well, then, that was what happened. The entire crew and the army and King Sunan and a lot of other courtiers, they started set sail to Selang. A few days later, they had... You know, after sailing, the crew, despite their reluctance, had to keep merry. So can you, they, they used to sing songs and keep merry. So would you do one, two, three, snap, snap. One, two, three, snap, snap. One, two, three, snap. There once was a ship that went to sea and the name of the ship was a B.O.T. The winds blew up, the boat dipped down below my bully boys blow. But they didn't sing this song, but something like this to keep their spirits pepped up. And they sailed and sailed and sailed. And then they came to a land called Tenang. Then the captain of the ship came and said, Your Majesty, we can't go any more southbound than this because this is the last of it. I still beseech you, let us turn around and go back. This is a wild goose chase and a futile attempt. King Sunan said, It will be the end of the voyage when I say it is. We have landed here. Send a few soldiers afoot into the town. Surely some merchants and traders will know where this Selang is. And uh, till then, we will dock here and replenish. So a few soldiers went into the town inquiring about where Selang would be. There was uh, an old man sitting outside his hut. And uh, the soldiers went and asked him, Kind sir, 
Would you know where Selang is? <laughs> I have not even been to the neighboring village. My dear boy, you ask me about Selang? Okay, thank you, sir. Then they went to the town square where there were a lot of men drinking tea and chatting up. And they asked him, they asked them about Selang and they, those men wanted to tease them a bit, these soldiers. So, ah, King Sunan, you say? Yes, yes, King Sunan. Oh, we've heard he's got a big army and a big, uh, uh, you know, lots of arms and lots of soldiers and all. Yes, yes, a few of them are here. In fact, we are the soldiers from King Sunan's arm. Oh, we've heard he's got a big, you know, very wise minister and lots and lots of courtiers who know a lot of things. Yes, yes, some of them are on the ship with us. Uh, and despite all this, you don't know the way to Selang? Ridiculous. And that was when the soldiers realized that those men were taunting them. So they said, thank you, sirs. You've been extremely helpful and walked their way. And while they were walking, they spoke to one another. I do hope this King Sunan gives up this idea of invading Selang. It's such a bad thought. Why does he want to invade Selang? And there was a passerby there who overheard this. Now, this passerby had a friend who had a friend whose brother-in-law's cousin was working in King Hien's court in Selang. He knew that King Sunan was looking to invade the Selang. And he knew better than to open his mouth. Mm -mm. So he waited till the soldiers walked away and somehow by secret means passed this message on and on and on to his cousin. And when this reached King Hien's court in Selang, it stirred up a hornet's nest. Everybody was worried and tense. And King Hien was like King Tuman, a very wise and noble ruler. And like any wise ruler would not want war. He wanted to aver avert war. So he said, what do I do? So there was an old minister sitting in the corner, stroking his beard. He said, I know what to do. Uh, well then, what should we do? So the old minister said, uh, spoke to the general. Well, I want a ship to sail to this Tenag. So the general got up very enthusiastically and said, oh, ship? Yes, you will have the most stylish, the shiniest state-of-the-art ship, all with bells and whistles waiting for you. Uh, 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 uh. I don't want a state-of-the-art ship and all. Just a beat-up, worn-down ship will do. Just strong enough to sail, but that's all. Beat-up ship? Why? No, trust me, I know what I'm asking for. Okay. So the next day, the general got such a ship and docked it at the shores and then came back. And there they were standing, dashing young, handsome men, all prim and proper in their white uniforms with caps and scarves and everything. And he said, look, this is the crew that is going to sail with you on that ship. The old minister saw and said, oh, okay, but no can do. Please send them back. I don't want them. The general opened his eyes wide. Why, what's wrong with them? He said, nothing's wrong with them, but they don't fit the bill. Okay. And they were all dismissed. And the old minister, come evening, brought everybody back to see the crew that he had lined up. And there they were, very tired looking, frail men, shabby and unkempt and very, very weak. The general looked at them from left to right and right to left. This is the crew that is going to sail? Yes, this is the crew that is going to sail. Oh, you, you mean the kind of sailing that is done on the ships on waters? Yes, what else kind of sailing is there? That is the sailing. Yes, oh, okay. Well, they couldn't say much because the king had immense faith on this old minister. And uh, then the old minister took everybody into the garden. He said, follow me into the garden, please. Oh, And then when they were in the garden, he said, boys, bring me big pots and plant some trees into the pots and load them onto the ship. Plant trees into pots. Don't we plant saplings into pots and then they become trees? Well, yes, we don't have so much time. And if you don't have that big pots, get it done by the potters downhill there. And we will put trees into it and load them onto the ship. Well, what ridiculous and absurd requests. But the general didn't have a choice. And then he said, fine. And then when they were about to go, the general said, that's all? Shall we set sail? No, no. There's one more last request. And he said, okay. And... Uh, 
ask soldiers to get me 10 sacks of rusted nails. Rusted nails? Why? Well, uh, trust me. But ask them to be cautious because they are rusted. And then all the soldiers went about near the ironsmiths and blacksmiths and gathered these rusted nails. And one soldier spoke to another, I hope these nails save Selang, otherwise it will literally be, literally be a case of for the want of a nail, a battle was lost. Oh, please. And then they took all the nails, went and loaded them onto the ship. And the ship started to sail and sail and sail till it reached the shores of Tenang. And as it was approaching Tenang, King Sunan and his crew witnessed what kind of a ship is this? I mean, what is it? Is it a ship? Why does it look like a garden though? Oh, and as it came and docked there, they saw these old and frail and weak looking men carrying these sacks and walking down the ramp. And they were singing, how long has it been? Since I left home, oh, deep blue sea, please talk to me. I just want to go home. And they were staggeredly walking. And King Sunan said, Ahoy there, who are you? And the men, this the sad sounding song was so pathetic to listen to. He said, well, we have come from the land of Selah. Selak! And everybody's antony popped up. Yes, dear sir, Selang it is. Well, what are you doing here? We have uh, come to trade. You see, we are traders from the land of Selang. But it so happened that we set sail a long, 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 long time ago. And we were like you, all of you, dashing, smart, young and handsome. And by the time we reached Tenang, look how have we how we have become. And these are iron bars, shiny, gleamy iron bars that we were supposed to trade. And look, they have turned into rust. And very soon they will turn into dust. Oh God. And those trees, those are exotic saplings which we were supposed to trade. And look, they have turned into trees. Oh, how long has it been since I saw home? I just wished I would go home. And that is the time it struck King Sunan that this Selang could probably be a wild goose chase. And sweat started trickling down his brow. And he looked at his prime minister. You think? And the prime minister jumped at, yes, I, do. I know, I know. You will say bird, bush and everything. Shush! Let's turn the ship and go back home. And everybody jumped with joy and went up. Uh, into the ship as fast as they could. And the captain steered the ship as fast as he could before he thought King Sunan would change his mind. And they were far into the waters. And this crew on the, on the Selang ship uh, felt so happy that they had averted war thanks to the old minister. So the end, thank you. Thank you, Divya. Thank you, Divya. That was such a wonderful and fun story. You want to come closer so we can yeah. talk to you? I'm sure yeah. the audience wants to see you some more. <laughs> um, I think the audience here would have had a lovely time as well. It was a real fun story, yeah, wasn't it? Great. You can all see people nodding in there. <laughs> a wild goose chase. So, where did you read the story from? Where did you get the story from? Uh, one of uh, a book which had a lot of folk tales. So okay. I just picked it. So which, um, do you know which country or where this folk tale comes it from? It just said East Asian. Uh -huh. It didn't mention anything particular. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. I think that's that's one fun story we would like to, all of us would like to add to our repertoire, I think. <laughs> um, so opening it up to the audience here, you want to say something about the story? Anything that you enjoyed? Oh, okay. okay, for the live audience, especially the singing part was great. Okay. All right. I enjoyed the subtle humor that she was trying to bring in here and there. It's just one word, two words. Of course, it was it was nice to listen to. So we were hearing a lot of humor, you yes. know, 
interspersed between almost every other space, there was something that she was you know, dropping in yeah. there. And that was really nice. Was yes, of course. <laughs> yes, the audience was smiling and laughing and giggling throughout. Yes. Thank you. Uh, very subtle and beautiful one. Yes, definitely. Thank yes. you. Um, anybody online, you want to share something? I just like the... Um, um, one second. One second. Yeah. I appreciated the um, the anachronisms, you know, like talking about, um, you know, the spine and the the uh, the specific, uh, you know, part of the spinal column, that kind of thing, that just things that came in. Those were fun. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I like the combination uh, of the story, which is from Asia, with the marine songs, which are completely not from these regions, but it's, it's, it's a really yet, great combination. I love yeah, I, combining like this. Mm -hmm. And as you're saying, yes, very true. The songs were nowhere near what the actual story was, but she very beautifully interspersed them. You know, she managed to really bring yeah. the whole thing together. So very well done on that. Yes. Also, one thing, uh, very, very, very interesting, I think, is that uh, maybe the story is completely far from, uh, you know, exotic for for my context. I live I live in Poland, but uh, the song, the marine song, is completely known by me. So this is something that sometimes we can put to the audience something they know already or they are, uh, yeah, they are attached to, and then we can throw uh, some completely new uh, concepts. Yeah, beautiful story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Divya. Thank you yeah. so much for that. Thanks a lot, story. everybody. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> moving on to our next storyteller for the day. Uh, can I please invite Lalita Tilak again from Chennai? Um, Lalita is here to share the story with us. Let me just spotlight this. And then, Lalita, please take the hot seat. It's all yours. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hello to the audience here. Hello, online audience. Thank you, Eric. This is my third time in Chennai Storytelling Festival. And thank you, Pratigya, for hosting and coordinating this whole event. All right. I am Lalita, as Pratigya said. I'm from Chennai. And uh, today, I'm just going to tell a story which is very close to my heart. And I really hope you all too like the story. So let's just straight get away into the story. The victory drums could be heard from a distance and chants of Jai Shri Ram, Jai Shri Ram were reverberating throughout. Sitting under the Ashoka tree, Sita could sense that these were signs of something good. You see, it had been 10 months since she had been abducted by Ravana, the demon king of Lanka. To tell you in brief, Rama, the prince of Ayodhya, was sent to exile for 14 years. In the 13th year, Ravana, the demon king, abducted his wife Sita, who had accompanied him. And why she was abducted? Well, a story for another day. But she was abducted in the 13th year of exile. Sita, Sita refused to enter Ravana's palace. And that is why, for 10 months, she sat under the same Ashoka tree, which was in the Ashoka Vatika, or garden, a beautiful garden in the outskirts of Lanka. Now she was guarded not by 10, not even 100, but 700 demonesses. And do you think these demonesses left her in peace? Oh no. They didn't torture her physically, but yes, they did everything they could to torture her mentally and emotionally. They constantly taunted her, they threatened her, they frightened her. And they tried to scare her and uh, uh, bully her. But you know, Sita was always confident and she was full of faith and hope that one day her Rama will come and rescue her. The war had finally ended. That day, Sita sensed an unusual silence in the Vatika. The usual chatter, the banter of all the demonesses were missing and everybody had become quiet. They had also bowed their heads 
to pave the way for someone to enter the garden. Oh yes, it was the mighty Hanuman, the minister of the Vanara army, the monkey army. Now these demonesses, they were all terrified of Hanuman because they did not forget his previous visit to the Ashoka Vatika where he had created so much of havoc, destruction. So they were all terrified that day. They bowed their head. Hanuman entered jubilantly. He walked towards Sita and he bowed his head and he said, Mata, which means mother, I have good news for you, Mata. Lord Rama, he has killed Ravana and we are victorious. Tears of joy rolled from Sita's eyes. After all, this was what she was waiting for. Her penance, her prayers, all of them were finally answered. She was so happy. She looked at Hanuman and she said, Hanuman, you've got me such good news. Ask for any boon you want. I will grant you. Now Hanuman once again bowed his head and he said, Mata, to serve you and Lord is the greatest boon I have. What more can I ask for? But Sita was insistent. And that's when Hanuman looked around. He looked around at all the demonesses and he was filled with terrible anger. And he said, Mata, give me permission. I want to kill all these demonesses. Sita was shocked. And she said, why would you want to do that, Hanuman? And Hanuman said, Mata, when I came as a messenger of the Lord, I turned into a tiny monkey and I sat right on the top of this very tree, Mata. I saw with my very own eyes, I saw how all these demonesses, how they bullied you, how they tortured you, how they fight you. Mata, you were in a lot of pain, Mata. Really, you know what I want to do? I want to scratch them with my nails. I want to hit them with my mates. I just want to throw them into the ocean. Sita was aghast and she said, Hanuman, Hanuman, calm down. But Mata, Hanuman, calm down. You know, Ravana, he is the sinner and he has been killed. These demonesses, they are all just servants of Ravana who have carrying out his orders. Why do you want to harm them? Hanuman was still actually, no, Mata, I saw with my own eyes. You were in trouble. They were so bad to you. They also have to be treated badly. Sita once again calmed down Hanuman and said, Hanuman, my child, come sit near me. Let me tell you a story. And this is when Sita began her story. A long time ago in a forest, a skilled hunter went out hunting. Now he encountered a ferocious lion. And yes, during the encounter, okay, he was a very skilled and very brave hunter. The encounter went on for some time. But somewhere in between, the hunter tripped. He lost his balance. And all the weapons went astray. The hunter was totally defenseless. And there, the lion was there right in front of him, ready to pounce on him. And that's when the hunter ran. He just ran. He ran and ran and ran and ran. The lion was not behind, far behind. And finally, the hunter found a tall tree. And what did he do? Of course, he quickly climbed, 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 climbed and reached the topmost branch. The lion was just in time and was there right at the bottom of the tree. Oh, letting out a loud roar. But yes, the hunter on topmost branch heaved a sigh of relief. Not for long, because just in front of him, there was a fierce, huge bear sitting. Oh, imagine, right below, the roaring, hungry lion. And in front of him, this fierce, huge bear. What could the hunter do? And you know what he did? He quickly folded his hands and he pleaded to the bear and he said, Oh bear, please, please, please spare my life. I've been running, 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 saving my life from the lion down. Please spare my life. The bear looked at the hunter and said, Oh human, you have come to my abode. You're begging for your life. I promise you, I will not push you down. You are safe here. The hunter was relieved and he was so tired and that he just fell asleep. What do you think happened to the lion? Oh yes, it was there right down. Oh, roaring, all hungry. He was not ready to give up the lion. And yes, he saw that the hunter had fallen asleep. 
So the lion looked up. He thought, okay, oh, bear. You know, this human, he is our common enemy. Just push him down. Let us both devour the human. Both of us can have a hearty meal. So the lion did all his best to instigate the bear. The bear heard the lion. You know what the bear said? Oh, lion, I have given my word to the hunter. I shall not push him down. He has come to my abode and I am protecting him. The lion was angry and let out a loud roar. And the hunter woke up with a start. He just saw, he thought he was down near the lion, but he was there, up safe. He looked at the bear and he felt relieved. Now, after a while, the bear fell asleep. Do you think the lion has gone? Oh no, it's still there. And the lion saw that he had another chance. So he looked up at the hunter and said, Oh, hunter, it's either going to be you or the bear. I'm very hungry. I'm not going to leave this place without having my meal. The hunter, without even thinking <laughs> twice, he just pushed the bear down. The sleeping bear, mid-air, suddenly woke up and caught onto a branch. You know, he was so alert that he just got onto a branch. And there, the hunter on the topmost branch, the bear hanging mid-air, and the lion below. The lion let out a loud roaring laugh. Ha, 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 ha. And he taunted the bear. Oh, foolish bear. You saw how ungrateful this human is. You, he doesn't deserve your goodness. Go, go, go up. You push him. You were kind to him. But all he did was push you when he was sleeping to save his life. He doesn't deserve your kindness. Go up, bear. So the bear heard all what the lion had to say and the bear looked very angry. The hunter on top was uh, terrified because he knew that he won't be spared. The bear was slowly inching up towards the topmost branch and the lion from below, come on, come on, we're gonna have a hearty meal. These humans, they are all selfish. Come on, push him down, we shall eat them. And the bear was moving, the hunter was trembling. And the bear reached the topmost branch. The hunter was literally shivering because he knew that the bear looked so angry at him. Then the bear looked down and the lion said, Come on, what are you waiting for? Let's have a feast. Push him down. The bear said, Oh lion, why should I give up on my goodness because of this human's badness? Great people do not imitate acts of cruelty. I have given my word to this hunter and I shall not push him down. I will hold on to my values and principles. Sita Mata ended her story here. She looked at Hanuman and she asked a question. Hanuman, who would you like to be? The bear or the human? And my dear friends, both online and offline, who do you think Hanuman would have wanted to be? Thank you. Thank you. A story within a story, isn't that wonderful? Thank you, Lalita, for the wonderful story. Thank you. Uh, let me just... The spotlight and move on to the gallery view. Um, so just opening it out to the audience. Yes, any any thoughts, any reflections about the story? Maybe first to the live audience. It was very, uh, you know, there's this sort of the values and all inside the story which brought out very wonderful here. Thank you. In case, yeah, in case the audience online didn't hear that. We're talking about how the values in the story have been, you know, interspersed into the story. There's lots of learning that happens, especially for kids. Of course, for us as well. But it's it's a it's an easy way to teach children these things. I'm gonna move in a little more. So yeah. Yes. Anybody else? In that case, I would invite you here so everybody else can hear you. You wanna come here? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Is this part of Ram as a story or is it? A when I researched it, when I researched it, I found it. See, there are many versions of Ramayana. 
and uh, when I saw it, I found it in two three sites. So it is. So we know that there are a lot of stories within stories in our epic. So how much of it is part and how much of it has been added, we don't know. But when I researched, it was there in two three sites. Instead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sorry, anybody else? Any other thoughts, reflections? Yes, I think a Ramayana story always leaves a lot to think about. It also takes time to sink in at times because these stories are quite strong and quite heavy in that sense. So I think with that, we'll move on to our next teller for the day. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank Lally. you all. Thank you, Prakriti. Thank you. The next telling is rather an interesting one, a different one. Uh, the story is being told by Ambujawalli, again, a storyteller based in Chennai. But what is very different about today's telling is that she is going to tell her story along with playing her veena. So, um, so here we have trying to reset the video so she can get comfortable first with her the original sound has to be set to on i think they've already set that happy eric yeah okay so let me just tilt this down so we can see the teller and her instrument you want to yes. settle down first and then i can yes, do that let yeah. settle down. Just take your time sorry you want to not too good, right no 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 that is not required so while ambuja is still settling in with her veena I should have done my research, but I didn't. So I don't know much about Veena. If not, I could have given you some details about uh, what exactly that is. But oh, it, is it is a musical instrument, of course. Classical but uh, for those of you who are not from India, it's a classical musical instrument. Um, as far as I know, she has been Ambujavalli has been learning it, and she's working with her graduation. Is it? Ambujavalli? Not a graduation. Not a graduation, no. but she's been learning it. Learning. Okay. So you want, you, uh, are you I ready? I just want or? to check if they're able to listen. I mean, hear the music. Yeah, that is yes. really fine. Great. Thank you. Let me just reset that. Yeah. So. And yeah. can I ask what's the name of this instrument? Veena. I'll put it down in the chat. Yeah, I'll put it down okay. in the chat. Yes, it's called Veena. I'll write it down in the chat. Yeah. Are we ready to go? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Over to Ambuja Valley. Maybe you have to hold this chair. Okay. Anything else? Fine. All fine. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah, this instrument is called uh, Veena. Uh, and, uh, well, I'm still learning. I'm trying out something. Okay. Not, not for the first time, but still, I'm still on that process. I hope, like, uh, I, and CSF is one place where I try everything new. This is a place where I try everything new. And so, you know, I'm going to try this also here. And um, this CSF has been parallel stories for me. A workshop on parallel narratives and all the stories that I have shared as part of this year's CSF has been a parallel narrative in some way or the other. And so now there's another parallel narrative. And since it is music and you're supposed to dwell deep into it, the camera is tilted and everybody's supposed to look down. And the artist is always supposed to look up to the audience. And so I'm looking up at you and thanks for looking down at me. Thank you. Mahishasura, the buffalo-headed demon. His penance was coming to an end. His penance was so sincere, so severe, that Lord Brahma, the creator, couldn't help but appear in front of him. What is that you want, Mahishasura? he asked. Immortality is what I want, he replied. Oh, that is the only thing I cannot grant you. Ask for something else. Well, in that case, no man should kill me. No animal should kill me. No existing celestial being should kill me. If you want a choice, maybe a woman can kill me. 
तथास्तु सो बी इट सेड ब्रह्मा ब्रह्मा यू हैव जस्ट नाउ गिवन मी द बोन ऑफ इमोर्टैलिटी अ वुमन किलिंग मी हाउ इज दैट इवन पॉसिबल एंड आफ्टर दैट नथिंग कुड स्टॉप महिषासुरा एंड दिस डीमन बिकेम आउटरेजियस he destroyed everything on the earth and then he went to the nether world too the nether world was gone in a moment was he happy no there was one more thing remaining and that was the indra loka the abode of the demi gods he wanted to conquer that too he went there the devas were scared they knew of the boon what to do and all the devas the demi gods fled away from the palace and there was mahishasura all by himself sitting on the throne of indra looking around victoriously and this is my palace well as mahishasura is enjoying his victory let us move to a different time frame but the same place indra loka all the devas were happy they were celebrating something why because they have got this urn filled with a divine potion called the somaris or the divine elixir the invigorating inebriating potion that was supposed to give a lot of benefits they were so happy that they have got that and that was taken to custody after the celebration now there was this little group of people among the devas called the gandharvas the gandharvas are supposed to be born from the fragrance of the flowers there was one gandharva vishwavasu he looked at the urn and this urn is supposed to belong only to the gandharvas not to anyone else and what did he do with his friends he made a plan the whole night and the next morning when the devas woke up the urn was gone gods being gods they knew what had happened to that urn but here came the problem if an enemy betrays you it is easy you can confront him you can fight with him but when a friend betrays what do you do how do you maintain the relation but still you solve the problem and that was a problem for the devas they didn't know what to do whom to ask they all started to discuss while the devas are discussing trying to come up with a solution to find the urn let's go and see what happened to mahishasura here the devas who all fled away they went to meet the three gods brahma the creator vishnu the protector and shiva the destroyer and there was a heated discussion how to get rid of this mahishasura a man cannot kill him an animal cannot kill him all of us we cannot kill him what to do whom to ask what is the solution a woman came the answer not a normal woman a goddess whom we all will create with all our powers and she will destroy mahishasura and all the gods came together and there was a big ball of fire from which appeared a beautiful goddess and all the gods gave their weapons to this goddess a 
lion was given as her vehicle. And there stood the goddess, dressed in a bright red sari, adorned with lots of jewels, emanating a beautiful radiance around her. Ten arms holding ten weapons seated on a lion with a face. And a will to kill. While the Devas, not knowing how to get the urn back from their friends, they went to Vishnu, give us a solution. And Vishnu said, Saraswati, the wife of Brahma, she is the right person. Go to her. And the Devas went to meet Saraswati, the goddess of knowledge. And there she was, sitting on a white lotus, clad in a white sari, wearing white pearls, with a white swan nearby, with a veena on her lap, white peaceful light around her. Mother, please give us a solution. With a smile, Saraswati said, I will take care of it, don't worry. And she got up, holding her veena in her hand and with a will to solve. When Durga, seated on the lion, entered the Indra Loka, the whole universe shook with fear. Mahashasura got off the throne, he came out of the palace, and one look at her. Who is this beauty? He looked at her and asked, Oh beauty, will you marry me? Why not? replied Durga. Only if you win me in a battle. Aha! Uh -huh. A battle with a beautiful woman. What more can I ask for? That's interesting, thought Mahishasura. And the battle began between Durga and Mahishasura. Mahishasura was a shape shifter. He could change his shapes the way he wanted. But Durga wouldn't leave him. She kept on chasing him wherever he went. Nine days the battle lasted. On the tenth day, when he turned into a buffalo again, Durga raised her trident. And that was the end of Mahishasura. Well, Saraswati got into the garden of the Gandharvas. She sat there with a the veena on her lap. And as her fingers started moving on her veena, Gandharvas, attracted by the music, they all came near Saraswati. Their eyes closed by themselves. Tears started flowing from their eyes, tears of joy. Mellifluous music filled the air and once Saraswati stopped, the Gandharvas couldn't control themselves. Mother, please teach us how to play this divine instrument. And Saraswati said, of course, I would love to do that, but my hands are tied. Why mother, don't we deserve to learn this divine art? Exactly. Art stays with only with those who are truthful. 
and the Gandharvas got the cue and immediately returned the urn back to the Devas. For learning the divine instrument was more precious to them than that divine elixir. Just before dying, Mahishasura apologized for all his mistakes and requested Durga, Mother, please let my soul be with you always. And Durga readily agreed. Peace retained in Indraloka, all the friends became friends again. A deva came to Saraswati and said, Mother, maybe you should have gone down with the Veena to Mahishasura. It would have saved a lot of bloodshed. With a smile, Saraswati said, Fire can never quench thirst and water can never ignite a flame. She is Durga and I am Saraswati. We are created for a purpose and our purpose is our identity, isn't it? Thanks so much. Thanks to all the teachers and the teaching elements of the universe. Thanks for listening. Are you comfortable with it? Yes, yes, no, I'll get a bag. Like how would normally just pull that? Yes. Oh my god, that was just excellent. Uh, parallel narratives and Avina interspersed into the parallel narrative. Mm. That's I think different level altogether. So three different you know, three different layers going on at the same time. Amazing, Ambu. I think all of us definitely want to give you another round of applause Thank here. Thank you so much. Um, I think this time I will open it out to the audience online. Any thoughts, reflections? How did you enjoy the story? Okay. Then we have... I'll, I'll yeah, just say, I'll just say it was beautiful. I, I loved, and you did it so smoothly. Okay. Huh. Uh, I, it, it seems. Yes, buddy. You want to go ahead? It, it almost feels like false humility for you, you to say you're you still better. learning because you seem uh, to be quite a master at it. Sorry, buddy. You'll have to start from the beginning because we missed your uh, your comment. Could you say it again for us, please? Could you repeat it? Buddy, can you hear me? Yeah, could you please repeat yourself? We just missed your uh, comment, please. Okay. I'm sorry. I said, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. we can. Okay, I just said it was beautiful, and, and it almost strikes me as false humility for you to say you were just learning because you seem like quite a master at it. It was just spotless and seamless, and it just worked together so nicely. It was just uh, such a pleasure to listen to. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for those kind words, Barry. Yes, anybody else online? Hi, um, Ambu, as um, this is, um, you're, you're creating a new niche for yourself. You know, bringing in uh, the two things that you really like so much. One is playing Veena and one is uh, your storytelling. It was so beautiful. And we were all looking and uh, saying, okay, is Ambu Saraswati or Parati? Is she Saraswati or Parati? What is she? What is she? So it was so beautiful. Enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lavanya. Actually, here I would have to mention my first Veena story. I would give the credit to uh, Lavanya, Meera and all the team for pushing me to do that one year back. So, yes, the credit goes to my storytelling clan, my Veena teacher and all my storytelling teachers for making this happen. Uh, anybody else? Online? Yeah, I would like to say that that was really a beautiful combination of this instrument, which is uh, completely um, yeah new for for me to hear, and uh, the story. And uh, is it possible that you have uh, somehow the story also in a written? Yes. form that uh, you can uh, you can send it somehow because 
really, I need to dive into research about all these concepts because I'm not, uh, they are not, um, not familiar uh, to me. Uh, uh, I know a little, little bit of, you know, uh, Vishnu, uh, Saraswati, Durga, but it's still like, wow, you, you know, you have the visual concept of the goddess and gods, and I don't have it. And I need to first have the concept and then dive into the story. That's why I would like to really um, digest and have, a, have a, a, all of or get all of it from the story because now it's a little bit too 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 complicated for me to understand the whole story yeah i don't know if it's possible to to get the written form maybe yeah sure definitely maybe you uh, you drop in your um you share your email id with eric i will get it from him and uh, we can get in touch and uh, i'd be glad to share whatever i know with you great Thank you. Hi, ma'am. Hi, Abby. Mom, it, uh, it was so beautiful, ma'am. I liked both. I am seeing first time you're playing Veena, ma'am. It was so amazing. Thank I'm you, Thanks for Super joining. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Okay, I think I'll open it out to the live audience here. Anybody wants to share any reflections, thoughts? I think how you brought two stories. Those two ideas. I just want to say uh, it was just wow for me. I was listening to the Veena parallelly and the story. Uh, so it was a new experience for me as well. So thank you so much. It was thank wonderful. You. Nothing, you know, you know, speechless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. I think I'll open it out to the live audience right here now. Uh, yes, you were saying something. Yeah, no, I like how you brought in the parallels and okay. how you ended with the identity when when the question was placed, like if you had gone down the wall, would have happened. I loved how you you know like placed the identity there and the value the character in this village. And thank you so much. Thank you. And you were really really good. I mean, thank it you. just brought me back to do Darshan days where <laughs> they play instrument and. Yes. So it, it is really nice when you listen to stories when you know like like Bhav and they play instruments. So I've heard the part I want. This is very nice. Thank, Thank you. So you. For the ending, I would give the credit to my son because yeah. they have have these questions. Why not this? Why not this? And we tend to come up with the solution. Yeah, I yeah. think you're getting it. Yeah. Uh, just checking. Um, yeah. People online, are you able to hear the live audience here? The the response that was heard here. Yes. No, on and off, little bit here and there. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll invite them here and they can speak louder. Yeah, that will help. So that was a long response. I'm afraid I can't repeat it. But of course, she enjoyed the parallel narratives and the Veena interspersed and it took her back to her childhood days. Yes, that kind of sums up what she was saying. Um, yes, anybody else? Any other? Ambu totally mesmerized. Lalita, you want to come over? <laughs> Okay, somebody is completely mesmerized and we completely forgot to take pictures and I'm going to get thrown away as well. Definitely. I forgot definitely, as well. Yes, <laughs> yes Vasugi ma'am. Uh, ma'am, you're really soft. You need to come. <laughs> very soft. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I'm going to move you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is what we call a wedding feast. Mm -hmm. Listening is feast to the ears, right? So storytelling is feast, listening to stories is a feast, and listening to music is also a feast to the ears. So now we've got a double bonus of listening to both music and storytelling at the same time with a little bit of philosophy and ID thrown into it. So I thought it was amazing storytelling, Ambu. Thank you Thank very you, much. Thank you. Ma'am? Vasili ma'am. Hi ma'am. Hi. Hi guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, friends meeting up online. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> 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 Maybe sometime in person. Um, yes, anybody else? Any other thoughts? Any reflections? 
no i think we'll we'll wrap it up with that um, yes. once again amazing performance thank you so much yeah. we really thanks enjoyed that thanks a lot thanks much. Sorry, i i just want to give my view about ambush performance yes please uh, yes please when we were young kids we used to see this music and story on tv we used to we used to enjoy it of course there was a lot, lot of editing on those days but now it's just live and ambu you were just amazing or whatever you said now it's like gone deep inside my heart i am very sure it has impacted all of us over here too thank you ambu for such a beautiful performance thank you sochi thanks a lot hello hello Hello. Ah, so long, ma. Yes, I'm at the call. Hello. Okay. Um, let me just check. So I think um, we are done with our tellers in person again from Chennai, part of Chennai Storytellers. But we still have two more storytellers at the hybrid event today. Um, I mean, the next teller we have is Millie Jackdaw. Millie, are you here? Oh, you've logged in with Nicola's ID. Okay, good to see you here, Millie. Let me just spotlight you. Uh, Millie Jackdaw is from the UK. Please fully introduce yourself and tell us a story. I think you're on mute. Yes, please go ahead. Hello, thank you so much for that absolutely amazing storytelling. I'm sorry I came in part way through, so I didn't see the whole thing, but it's it's very early here in Wales. So um, in Welsh, we say croeso and cavachion. So croeso, welcome, cavachion, greetings. So I send you greetings from these Welsh Celtic lands, these lands of the dragons. Uh, we have dragons here in Wales. I'm sure you have them there too. And the story I'm going to tell you today uh, links in with the dragons of this land. Um, but it's also my own story. So I'm, I'm weaving together my own journey to becoming a storyteller and, and some things from my own life, some of my own experiences and the mythology of Wales and how the mythology of Wales sort of called me to it and, and took me on a bit of a healing journey. So we're going to begin in London in 1992. And I'm on a dance floor. The music is amazing. The music is incredible. Music such as I've never heard before. Music that my body just knows how to move to when I let go and allow it. I make shapes I never knew I could make. And with these new shapes come new thoughts, new feelings, perceptions, inspiration. And around me, everyone else is doing this too. Together we are one big joyful explosion of humans. Can, can I just point out there's um, there's a, a microphone unmuted that I'm hearing um, sounds from. I think it's the it might be the main space. I'm not sure. It the global Nokia, HMD global Nokia. Let me just mute everybody and then you can unmute yourself and let's start. That's good. Mm. And among us is one particular human. There on the dance floor, I see him, my wizard. He appears to me as a wizard. The spell is cast. And the enchantment lasts for three years. At the end of which time, I find myself with a miraculous wonder child. A fatherless boy, as it turns out, the wizard having magically disappeared back into the wild realm from which he came. So now, let me take you back in time. Let me travel with you westward to Wales, back in the fifth century. 
We are in a stone circle in the Priscelli Hills, and a landscape of ancient sacred power. And there among the stones, we see a princess dancing in the, in the moonlight. There is a fire sparkling and crackling and around her, a circle of priestesses chanting. She dances barefoot on the damp grass. She dances and dances until time and reason loosen their hold. And then a vision appears. A glowing golden figure appears out of the darkness. They stand eye to eye and palm to palm. Rhythm of night and women and wind and the sparkling fire and the sparkling stars and their light seems to grow and merge as they become one. A single bright star shoots across the sky and the chanting reaches its zenith. Sometime after this event, the princess discovers she is pregnant. And since she cannot tell who is the father of her child, she is taken to the priory to be looked after by the nuns. They will be her midwives. When the time comes, she gives birth to a miraculous wonder child. A beautiful boy, one who is destined to re-enchant the land and stir the memories of the people. One in whom the dragon energies still flow. One who knows the songs, who dreams the dreams. We go back to London. 1990. Six. I have a child, a young boy, he's one year old, and my mum comes to visit. She tells me that I must take a day off. I'm a single mum. My child doesn't sleep well. I've gone through a difficult emotional experience becoming a single mum. There's much for me to process. I'm very grateful for the day off. And I've heard about a place called Uffington. And in this place, there is a Neolithic chalk figure carved into the hillside. It's to this place that I go on my one day off. I walk and I walk and the views are amazing. I can see for miles in all directions. There is the carved figure, the chalk horse on the side of the hill. Can you picture it now? A Neolithic chalk horse carved into the hillside. I make my way to the eye of the horse. Much crying and weeping has passed, but now I am calm. Now I sit in the eye of the horse and I meditate. I can feel the energy of the land rising up through me, flooding my body with healing energy. And then I'm aware of a presence. It's a presence of Merlin, someone who I haven't thought about for many, many years, not since I was a child, when I traveled with my family to Cornwall and heard all about King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and read all the stories. But here he is in my mind's eye and he's speaking to me. And I don't recall everything that he said, but one thing, stayed with me powerfully, which was this. He said, You cannot hope 
to comprehend the meaning of your own story from the limited perspective of the conditioned mind. Know this, your story is part of a much bigger story and it is a wondrous one. This was what you might call a moment of truth, of awakening to the greater wonders of existence. It was a moment that set me on a course to fulfill my dreams of becoming a professional actor and performing children's theatre in London, traveling around schools, speaking about nature and the environment through theatre and discovering storytelling. It's set me on a course to eventually leaving London and travelling across the breadth of Britain to Wales. And there I discovered a rich, rich body of mythology. And one such story that I heard one time told to me from a storyteller called Eric Madden from Australia, now settled in Wales, was the story of two kings, King Cleve and King Clovelis of Britain. They were brothers and Cleve ruled well over the land of Britain while Clovelis went and married a French pre um, princess. And during the reign of King Cleve, there was a disturbance in the land. Every May Eve on Beltane, which is a fire festival in the Celtic year, a terrible scream would call across the land. And wherever this scream went, people would suffer. Leaves would wither on the trees and fall to the ground. Rivers would dry up. Lakes would become stagnant. Pregnant women lost their babies. Things withered and died. Old men lost their minds. And the people appealed to Cleve that he must do something about this terrible, terrible plague. And so he consulted with his wiser brother, Clovelis, who instructed him what he must do. He told him that he must go to the very centre of Britain. And there he must take a vat of the sweetest mead and sink it into the ground. He must cover the vat with a mud-coloured cloth and he must have with him two stone jars and some beeswax for his ears. So he did this. On May Eve, on Beltane, he went to the very centre of Britain and he sank the vat of mead into the ground. He covered it with the cloth and then he hid himself with the beeswax in his ears to guard against the screaming. And he waited. Eventually, he could feel the reverberations coming through the ground and he knew that the screaming had begun again and he looked and he saw two dragons rising up from the land, one red, the other white, and they stretched out their leathery wings and they set to fighting one another, clashing through the air, fiery fangs and breath and teeth and claws and flashing eyes. Around and around each other they spiralled and eventually their power waned and they became two oxen charging through the ether, clashing horns. Over and over again they clashed and eventually they transformed once more into two little piglets 
and they came spiraling down, 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 falling from the sky into the vat of mead, through the cloth. Now mead, you may not know, is a very strong, very sweet alcoholic drink made from honey. It's very delicious and very alcoholic. And the piglets fell into this vat and they began to slurp and, and suckle up all the mead. They drank and they drank and they drank until they fell into a drunken, contented sleep. And King Clee came with his jars and he placed each one of the piglets into the stone jar. And he took the stone jars, he put them on his carriage and he carried them away to the place that he had been told to take them to the west, to Wales, to a place which was known as the strongest place in the land. He reached Wales and he headed northwards, eventually coming to a high hill, like a pregnant belly in the land. There was just one path that made its way up to the top of the hill. He followed this path and when he reached the top, he could see mountains in each direction. Great mountains, Snowdonia, the highest mountain range in Wales. And there on the top of the hill was a pool. And into that pool, he cast the stone jar. The water bubbled and the earth moved and closed over the jars, sealing those dragon piglets into the hill for a long, long time. Now, this story goes on. I'm just checking my time. How much time have I got left? I think we started a little late. You can take a few more minutes. Of course you can. We would yes. like, you would want you to finish the story. We can't leave you halfway there, can we? <laughs> <laughs> so in Carmarthen, there is a priory. The priory where young Ambrosius was born. And the time came when Ambrosius was called to do a service to the king. Now, this happened long, long after the burial of the piglets at the top of the hill, many, many centuries later. And by this time, we had a new king in Britain called Vortigern, but he was a bad king. He was a usurper king. To cut a long story short, he ended up being on the run from the Saxons whom he had invited into Britain. He was fleeing for his life and he fled to where he had been told was the strongest place in the land, a high hill. There he tried to build a tower, a fortress of safety. But each day that the tower was built, the following day, the masons would find the stonework fallen to the ground. And his wise advisers told him that the reason why the tower would not stand was because they needed to make a sacrifice. They needed the blood of a boy without a father. So they travelled throughout Wales and they found young Ambrosius, the boy who had been conceived that magical night in the Priscelli Hills. He had no father. They brought him with them to this high hill in Snowdonia that Vortigern's tower would not stand upon. And when they told him what was to be done, he leapt up onto the rocks and he pronounced that Vortigern's advisers had no idea what was truly beneath this land, but he could tell Vortigern. He told him that they must dig down. There they would find a pool.
pool, and when they drained the pool, they would find two stone jars. And within those jars were two dragons. And Vortigern, impressed by the confidence of this lad, ordered his men to do just that. They dug down, they found the pool, they drained the pool, they found the jars, and the jars cracked open, and out came the two dragons rising up into the air, their eyes flashing, their wings stretching out as they grew to their full size. They began once more spiralling around one another, flashing, their teeth clashing, their claws slashing. And eventually they disappeared into the distance, far away over the mountain. But the interesting thing about this story that I discovered was that the centre of Britain, it tells us in the story, was near Oxford, the place where he found these two dragons. And when I discovered this story, I thought, well, Oxford is not in the centre of Britain. It's quite a long way down. It's quite low. But then I discovered some really interesting information about ley lines. There's one big long ley line, the whole length of Britain, the spine of Albion. There's another one that comes across from west to east. And the place where they cross is a place called Uffington. The place that I went to many years ago before I knew anything about storytelling and where I met Merlin in the land. And that's where these two dragons rose up from the ground. That's the place that I later discovered was mentioned in this story. And young Ambrosius, after the dragons rose up from the hill, he gave a prophecy. And on giving this prophecy, he became Merlin otherwise known as Merlin in Britain. So that is my story. And I would like to invite you just to take a few moments, if I may, <laughs> just to close your eyes for a moment and imagine that you are in a wonderful place, a high hill, a sacred land, and that you can feel the energy of this place filling your body and your mind and filling you with inspiration. The stories are in the land. Is there a story that you have heard that has a strong message for you? Or a character in a story? A god or a goddess? A traveller? A merchant? Any character at all? An animal? From one of the stories that you've heard? It has a strong message for you. And you might like to take a moment just to write it down. What comes to you? Thank you, Millie. Thank you for taking us through a little internal reflection as well, along with sharing a story within a story and sharing a part of your own story. For me, the most uh, 
beautiful message was you need to understand and realize that your story is only a part of a bigger story that's such a philosophical and such a universal truth in a way um for us storytellers and for us as human beings as well um that, that was just beautiful for me thank you so much for sharing that story mili um opening it up to the audience any reflections thoughts does anybody want to share anything please go ahead yeah i was like a stone with this uh, with this story thank you thank you so much nicola and uh, the the way you were telling the story made me think that we are grounded we are rooted in some other um, bigger uh, concepts ideas myths and uh, uh, um, things that were be before us, that we are not here just with our story. We are rooted into something very deep, spiritual. So thank you so much. Yeah, I'm, re I'm really glad that, that that's what you got from it because that this whole thing has been about an adventure on the land, tuning into the energy of the land because the land is ancient and, and the stories are still there. It still has so much to share with us so hmm. also for me Millie this this kind of draws a parallel to uh, the story Regina was sharing yesterday uh, that was again a personal experience a personal story but in a way she was talking about how the land around her had given her some energy uh, the feeling of the place Oh, very much in resonance with what you're you're telling today. So that that is what mm. comes to my mind. Interesting. Mm. Yeah, I I actually got some funding last year from that experience that I had in 1996. Um, I then was curious to travel to other places that feature in the stories, so I I managed to get some funding to do that. So. Yeah, it's a really great process to see where are these stories located and then go to those places. Um, that is always hope to know that a storyteller gets a funding from somewhere for something that you're passionate about. <laughs> on that fun note, I think we would move on to our next teller. Thank you once again, Millie. Um, now we have uh, Tim Shepard from England. Um, Tim, let me just spotlight you first. Tim is going to share a story with us, but along with that, or right after, he's also been generous enough to give us a little talk on storytelling. So inviting you over, Tim, to share your story and then go ahead with your talk. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to get up for one moment because I've suddenly got the sun <laughs> coming around. It's going to blind me and you probably you. One moment. I'm very sorry. That's okay. Sorry. I'm surprised you decided to uh, change your direction because when I was living in London, uh, people would die for the sun. They would really do anything and everything yes. to get the sun in. So it's interesting to hear for once somebody's talking about, I don't want the sun there in England. <laughs> Over to you, Tim. I know. That's very true. And you'll hear about that in this story, actually. So uh, this is a story called Food, Fire and Company. And it comes from the middle of England, Derbyshire, Staffordshire. Not the center, <laughs> or maybe it is, I don't know. Um, but maybe this will tell you something about more about the land after Nicola's story. So there was an old woman and she lived in a tiny cottage. It just had one room and one door and one um, window and a tiny little garden, which she used to grow herbs in. And by the side of the hearth, there was a pile of turfs. These were turfs cut from the ancient peat to burn for fuel. Very, very old tradition. And one day she heard a great commotion shouting outside and she ran outside. Well, she didn't run, she hobbled outside 
and looked, and there was a man running by with dead rabbits under his arms. He was stealing, he was poaching them. And after him, up the road, came running the gamekeepers. They were chasing after him. But they stopped when they saw the woman and said, good morning. Very nice to, oh, what a lovely cottage you have. And they looked around and one of them stopped to gather some twigs and sticks so that she could light her fire and put them inside for her. And he said, you know, you've got such a lovely, tidy place here. You've got fire burning, you've got food, you've got company, except we have to go. And they ran after the poacher. Well, a little while later, the farmer came by in his horse and cart. Now he would drop in every now and again. He was very kind and he would give the old woman things that he had left. And he gave her today a sack of oats and half a pail of milk. And he said, there you go. You have food. What more could you want? And the old lady said, it is very nice here, but I wish I had company. I've had visitors, but nobody stays. And the farmer said, yes, I'm sorry. And he went to do his farming. So the old lady went inside and she put the oats over the fire to cook, put some milk in to make some porridge, but she made enough for two. And she served out one bowl and another bowl. And she took one bowl and she put it outside on the ground and called out and said, if anyone's there, do come by, you're very welcome. And she went back inside. She ate her evening meal, but nobody came. So she went to bed. The next morning she got up, she went outside. There was no porridge in the bowl. Somebody had eaten it. And she looked around and said, well, you're very welcome, whoever you are. Do come by next time and stay for a little. And so she went back inside. And uh, uh, later on, she came out to sniff the air. Every day, the smell of roses would drift across the valley for four miles away. There was a big manor house. It was known to be very, very lucky. And they had huge gardens full of roses. And those rose scent would rise up on the air and drift over. Ah, it was a great pleasure, but not today. There was no smell. Maybe it's the rain, she said. And it was pouring with rain, of course, because it's England. So, <laughs> so she went back inside and thought, well, I shall uh, put on some food. Oh, I'm, I'm running out of turfs. But luckily, later that day, the farmer came by in his cart and he brought some turfs for her fire. But it was still pouring with rain, of course. So they were soaking wet and he took them inside for her and she tried to light them, but they wouldn't light. And the farmer said, have you heard the news? She said, no, what's that? Well, over the way, you know that big old manor house? There's the old squire. He died recently and his nephew came down from London to take over, to live here. And do you know what? He drove the luck out. How did he do that? Said the woman. Well, you know that every day, every evening, they put out a, a bowl of food glass of milk uh, for you know who. And as soon as he saw it, he threw that to the dogs. Well, the old servants were so upset. They won't work for him anymore. They're gone. Gosh, said the woman. And she went inside, but she couldn't cook anything. So she took a bit of old bread and a glass of milk and she put them outside and she called out and said, if there's anyone there, you're very welcome, but do come and stay a bit. And she went back inside. But a little while later, there was a voice 
coming from outside. It was a strange voice. And it said, oh dear, oh, where can I go in rain and snow? Oh dear, oh, what can I do? Let me come in and stay with you. Who was that? Or what was that? Well, the old woman very bravely called out and said, well, you're welcome, do come in. Nobody deserves to stand out in this rain. And just then, a hand came round the corner of the door, a long, spindly brown hand. Well, it was kind of brown, but it was fuzzy and hazy. She thought she could see through. And as it came round the door, she realised and then an arm and then the rest shot along the wall she said that's probably the best place they might still be there's warmth up there but i'm so cold i'm going to have to go to bed i'm sorry there's no fire for you and so her eyes opened And there was a glow and she looked and was that the smell of baking? There was loaves on the uh, cooling on the surface and porridge cooking over the fire. And she called out and said, thank you so much who you are. And she got up and she ate some hot porridge and went back to bed nice and warm. Well, in the morning she got up and the farmer came by nice and early. He asked her if she could spare him a rose for his wife. What does she want that for, she said. Well, it's the well dressing today and she would love to use one. I love the well dressing. Now, well dressing was something that was done Every spring they had very beautifully. And the, the farmer said, look, you've got a great big flat slab over your spring. That would make a lovely place to decorate. Oh, said the old woman, I am too old and stiff. I can't bend down and pick things. I can't reach up and cut things. No, your wife is very welcome. Take a rose. Laura went off and she went back inside. Back inside to do the sweeping, get the fire going, put the food on. It was all done. It was all clean and tidy and the food was cooking. There was nothing left to do but to serve out the porridge. She didn't know what to say. Thank you so much, she said, and ate her breakfast. And then she thought, what do I do now? There's nothing left to do. I know I can go out in the garden. Maybe I can tidy it a little. And so she went out and she sniffed the air. Oh, that smell of roses was so strong today. It was almost as if they were right there. And they were. Big piles of rose petals piled up next to her spring. If she could jump for joy, she would have done. But instead she hobbled over and she thought, I can make a design. I can decorate the spring. And she spread some wet mud on the slab and she started to place the petals down. And she thought, if I can make this by midday, I shall be very happy, even though nobody else can come and see it. And so she carried on placing them. Of course, there were so many petals, she would never get through them all. But somehow the piles just went down and the petals, it was as if somebody was helping her. And then later on, the farmer, he came at midday when the bells were ringing from the church with the judges. The judges were coming to the village to judge the competition 
because all of these well dressings, they just they had somebody to decide who had done it the most beautifully. And the judges and the farmer came by and they looked and they said, oh, very nice. Oh, such a lovely smell, too. And off they went to the village. But that evening, the farmer brought them back and he brought some villagers and they all crowded around and the, the uh, uh, judges came up to the woman and they said, you know, you have won first prize. First prize, here's three silver pennies. Well, that was riches indeed. And the old woman said, thank you very much, do, do have a look. And one of the villagers said to her, yes, you know, there was a strange thing. Did you hear that the, uh, about the, the news at the manor? And she said, no, not at all. Oh, well, they've, uh, they had this beautiful rose garden, of course. And the squire, the new squire was desperate to win the well dressing. But there was no roses in the garden. The blooms, they'd all gone, nothing. The squire was so furious. He's gone back to live in London. Really? Said the old woman. And after they'd all gone, she went back inside and she looked at the swept floor and the fire blazing and the food cooking. And she thought, I have food, fire and company. How lucky I am. Thank you, whoever you are. And that is the story of Food, Fire and Company. Wow, Tim. Yes, all of us are clapping here. <laughs> Thank you. And I must tell you, um, to make sense of that a little bit, that in Britain we have uh, over 300 types of fairy, and these are nature spirits, and one of the most well-known is called the brownie. And it tends to attach itself to a house or a person. And it's very helpful if it's respected and very mischievous or just leaves if it's not. Hmm. Thank you. Thank I'd you. love to know. Um, I mean, I, I love a couple of things about this story, about what it tells us about community. But I wondered if anyone's got any response or questions. Hello, Tim. Hello, Eric. Hello, thank you so much. It's a wonderful story. And I want to hear what, what you feel it, it says about community. But uh, I just want to let you know, Pratigya is hosting the session today. Uh, but I'm very much here. And, uh, and, and after the discussion of the story, I, I'm, I'm hoping you'll, you'll say a few words about storytelling in general. Yeah, very happy to. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, there's um, there's a couple of things, I think. There's, there's a lovely tradition in this. And I know that there's a big tradition in India of uh, creating you know, devotional designs from natural things. Uh, I wondered if you do that, especially for springs or wells. But um, what I like is that the way that this feeling of community just kind of grows and grows. People giving gifts to each other, helping each other out, and everything starts to, to fill out and everything starts to work. But there's something underneath the surface, that sense of respect for something invisible, the spirit behind it all that can be so easily brought in, well, not so easily, but so easily lost, and the way that they paid attention to that made that sense of community secure. Everything started to work. Uh, the gifts and the kindness and the acceptance were important, but also something else. <laughs> and I think it's so important the way that in the story, the old, the new squire, just he just throws that away. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't respect the old ways and those old traditions can so easily be lost because of somebody who doesn't think they're important. Uh, but there's a practical wisdom in there. 
they do something more. That's what I like about it. But uh, there's no tradition lasts unless there's something very worthwhile behind it. That practical wisdom has to be there. Um, so, well, is, is there any, uh, any other thought or question before I move on to my talk? It's just a short little talk. Let me check with the uh, live audience here. Any thoughts, reflections? No, all right. Okay. Well, this story that hints about community, um, it reminds me of how I discovered that storytelling creates community. And this uh, was a very strong lesson for me uh, and how I discovered storytelling as a, a path, a personal change, really. So I'll tell you how I discovered it. When I was in my 20s, uh, one of the world's best circus schools opened up not very far from me. It was a pioneer in the new circus revolution. Uh, and I went along to have a look because I was already learning to juggle and I, I quite fancied doing that. And I found a kind of kindergarten for adults they had trapezes and juggling equipment, unicycles, <gasps> so fantastic. But this was the new circus. And that was about as much about performance and presence and narrative as it was about tricks and skills and, and physical things. Uh, so I really wanted to go, but the trouble was I'd been incredibly shy as a child and a young man uh, I was nervous about appearing in front of people. I didn't want to show myself. Um, but when I was there, I saw the previous people. They'd been training for a while in the performance side of it. And they started to turn from you know, quite nervous, anxious people, some of them, to really happy and confident. And I thought, that is what I need. Sign me up. <laughs> and I'm getting there. And... I learned skills and disciplines, but what they taught in everything, all of those range of skills, was how to engage the audience by something they called animating the moment. This moment, this, this, here, us. Making this moment a shared experience, authentic. And we learned proper oral storytelling too. So after I travelled around with the circus, because I, I trained and I learned these skills and I, I found the courage and the confidence to actually show some people, <laughs> it was, that was a kind of whole story in itself. Uh, I'm, I'm cutting that short because it's, uh, it was a big adventure for me. But I finally moved around and showed people. And I realized that the heart of all these things came down to storytelling. That was what everything had in common because storytelling is where this moment, it travels on a journey and the storyteller takes it on a journey. And I discovered that real power of storytelling and the connection with the audience. So, I was traveling around, flying through the air, doing dangerous things. But then after a while, I found that what I really wanted to do was simply tell stories and take people deeper. Instead of wowing people on the outside, I would want to wow them on the inside. And that act of engaging with the audience gave me a much deeper confidence. And I found the courage to be me, to express myself, not fearing anymore about being judged, just letting myself be me and be seen. Uh, it was a huge challenge, but my life was better. I was so much happier, I really happier. And all because of that power of story and facing audiences. Now, I know it is challenging to move into that, but it's not so difficult. It seems scary, but Telling stories is one thing, but really engaging and being in the moment, that's where the real treasure lies. 
it does demand that you are seen. And because you really shine when you are open, when you feel free, when you are really being yourself, uh, that is scary because we are afraid that people will see what we're really like. <laughs> <laughs> but of course that's what they're interested in and that's why we are interesting um so i found the joy of it and it really freed me so after a while i started teaching storytelling courses in how not to tell a story but how to be a storyteller how to be more yourself be human ah oh, gorgeous wonderful work so delightful, so freeing for so many people. But as I grew in that storytelling, I started to find other storytellers and I realized how nice storytellers are. <laughs> I bet some of you are nice, actually. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I love you all, I really do. <laughs> so I started to reach out to other storytellers and I felt like I was part of a community. I started to reach out on the internet, which was a new thing back then. I started to put out information and resources for people, for storytellers, uh, because I really wanted to gather people as a global community. Um, there were people, storytellers on their own, doing their own thing. And I'd heard that there are people in other countries, but everyone was a bit separate. This was way before social media and everything. So it was wonderful to actually bring people starting at least to get them to be aware and to share things. And the more I taught storytelling, I realized this was the lesson that I kept on coming to. Every time I told a story, every time one of my students learned to tell a little bit of a story, I realized that the act of storytelling in this moment creates community in this moment with you, and me and us. There's something very powerful about it in this magical space and moment, because we're all together, we're being immersed in one experience that we're all sharing. And that breaks down barriers between people. It makes us feel together, makes us feel we are sharing the same thing. And it makes us feel hope because those stories are so wonderfully full of hope and wisdom, all those folk tales. And that gives us, at least for a moment, a common understanding. We've all heard the same thing. We've all felt what we think must be the same thing. We feel that moment of community. And so that creates a bond, at least for a time. And I know you've all experienced it here, uh, at least for a time. So. The great bards, the epic singers, the Jirao, they call them in Kazakhstan, the Jali in Africa, these people, these real masters of epic storytelling, they all say the same thing, that storytelling makes you whole. It does, it makes you whole. And not just because the stories are wholesome or wise, but the act of storytelling demands that you become whole as you connect and you interact and you draw people together. And so storytelling can be a whole path in itself of serving people's deep needs, of developing wisdom, even spirituality. If you listen to your own stories, <laughs> well, not yours, but those ancient stories, they have treasure for you in their hands. And so that is what I did. I became much, much happier. I became a little more whole a little more human. And that happened as I led people through each story. I also started to become a leader. I started to have that confidence to work with people and to draw them into something for them that's made them whole. So my message is get out there. All those of you who have not told a story before, tell a story. It's not difficult to learn a story. It's not difficult to recite a story. The difficulty is feeling like you might be seen, but you're worth being seen. People will listen and they'll listen to the story so you can kind of 
disappear for a while if you're scared. <laughs> Tell the folk tale. Don't worry about getting the words right. You don't even need to do to learn how to do a somersault or fly on the trapeze like I did. You can just go straight out there. Just be yourself. Draw people in to that moment with you for that special moment of delight. Because it is easy with a story to draw people together into that moment and bridge that gap between you. And to talk from your heart to their heart, which is something we so normally are careful about. It will make you a better person and it will create community around you as you live your life. And do you know something? Just to finish, this year on the 20th of March, on World Storytelling Day, storytellers all over the world are going to be telling stories on a theme, and that theme is building bridges between people, between communities. And you can build a bridge by telling a story so you and others can be more seen. And we can be more human together because that's what the world needs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. That was beautiful the way uh, you told your story and more importantly, the transformation that you felt step by step. Um, and it's very interesting to know, very adventurous to know that you were juggling and you were into a circus and oh, very interesting indeed. And yeah. um, yes, coming to the idea of feeling of community. In a way, uh, that is what Chennai Storytelling Festival has been doing year after year. Um, especially after COVID where it's moved almost fully online, but for a few uh, hybrid sessions or and in-person sessions, we have been able to feel that we are one community. Um, I'm seeing most of them just in boxes. I probably see them only once a year besides FB and Insta and all the social media, but somehow I feel the connect. I feel I like, oh, I know Barry. I've seen him so often. Oh, I've, I've, I've seen Milia. I've seen you, Tim. Uh, I've seen mm -hmm. tellers across India and there is a sense of community which we uh, at the festival have been able to create and uh, I'm glad that you pointed that out and I'm glad that we've been uh, pathbreaking in that way and we have been working towards that as well and we have been successful in our own little teeny way and yes a big motivation for all of us to tell stories especially those who haven't tried I can see the audience you're nodding their head yes maybe they're going to go home and give a little story to somebody at least today. Thanks for the motivation, uh, Tim. Um, just opening it out to the audience before we wrap up the show, if there's anything you want to say, I think Eric wants to say something as well. Please, Eric, come over. Yes, Tim, thank you so much. And um, yes, since the pandemic, we, we've done this festival online. But I think even before that, maybe seven, eight or more years ago, you, you gave a talk to us by, by video conference, isn't it? Do you remember? Yes, yeah, I do, definitely. It might have been. Uh, you, uh, yes, you. you had a whole crowd. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so what I want to uh, follow up on and what you were talking about, um, yes, uh, I agree. Uh, storytelling is all about relationship. Uh, it's a relationship between the teller and the listener and the story. Uh, so it's sort of th a three-way relationship uh, that, that the teller and listener are having with the story. But then when we do this by video conference, there's another uh, partner in the, in the relationship, which is all this technology. <laughs> and the fact that we're doing this from one, you know, almost one side of the globe to another. How can you will you say anything about how the um the the fact that we're doing this by this technology how this adds to it or changes it or flavors it? Yeah, I think it's um I I see storytelling as one of the most direct things that you can do to relate to people. We we draw people together into this one moment. It's a common uh it's like it dissolves the barriers for a moment, the social barriers, the conscious of all our differences and so on. So the more you put in the way between people, the more there is to dissolve. So with uh, video conferencing, that technology 
uh, can be in the way a little bit more. Um, but it's not in the in the way as much as, say, watching a film or TV is, because those people have done something at a different time. Yes. They filmed a story and it's coming to you, but there's no interaction and there's no simultaneous time. So the video conferencing is is still pretty good as long as you're not too conscious of it, as long as it doesn't, you know, draw attention to itself all the time. But I think the real power of storytelling is that heart to heart. And that is something that's kind of beyond time and space in a way. It's it's there. We are immediately there with each other. And that subtle sense, as I was saying in my story, can be the most important thing. So I think you can still be yourself as long as you don't get more self-conscious because of the technology. I'd, I'd like to just tell you one little thing that um, I heard many years ago in here, in um, locally, we've got this storytelling festival called Beyond the Border. And many years ago, they used to bring people from the very oldest storytelling traditions across the world to come here and to show us how it's done because we'd lost a lot of our old traditions, but some places they've, they've never stopped. And we had the high bard called the Jiral from Kazakhstan. And he was an amazing man, such a presence. He would chant epics with his uh, two stringed lute. And he went on BBC World Service and um, BBC World Service is the, long, the largest radio audience in the world. It's something like 140 million people are listening at any one time, um, or at least it was then. So he went into a tiny little studio to do his thing. And his thing, of course, is has a great spiritual power to it. He tells a story about, you know, you have to be initiated to be that kind of a person. You have to go through a very severe training. And you need to learn huge amount of epic story. But most of all, you have to be a storyteller and really bring something from the deep out. And of course, he was in an airless little radio studio with nobody else there, no audience, nobody looking at him. He, how could he do that? And um, my friend who was there with him, uh, who took him along there, said, he sat down and then he just lit up and he spoke with such power. It just broadcast across the world mm -hmm. and he could just feel this something that went beyond everything. And I've seen that with those type of storytellers. They are beyond anything you can imagine if you've not seen one. But he could do that even through all of that technology. He just had to be himself, be human, and be in this moment in a way that he knew how to. And that broadcast across the world with such power. So, yes, I think the technology, don't be too distracted by it. Don't feel self-conscious because of it. And then you can still do your thing. Yeah, no, I don't feel distracted about it. I, I'm a fish in water with, with video conferencing. I I love it. And, um, you know, it seems like we're in the same room together. So uh, yeah. I just wonder what it's doing to our brains in a, in a good way. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's it's a different experience, isn't it? It's a medium, but it's, uh, it's a pretty good medium uh, if you're using it for storytelling. Yeah. I feel it has an epic quality to it. Because we're striding the world with giant steps and, uh, you know, going over great distances. I, I feel the epic feeling when, when I'm doing a video conference. <laughs> that's lovely. Yeah, I like that. Maybe that's a good advice, actually, for everyone. <laughs> but of course, you might not feel like you want to have an audience of hundreds of thousands. It's like, oh, maybe that's a bit too scary. <laughs> Go ahead, Pritya. Yeah, Eric is a great proponent of uh, online sessions and video conferencing. So I can, you can feel it when he's saying it. You know that he is, this is something that he really looks forward to, and as he keeps saying, that is the way forward for the world. 
Um, I think Nicola, uh, Millie, should I call you? Sorry, you want to uh, say something? Please go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, obviously the technology enables us to have this experience to be together. And and in a quantum sense, you know, quantum physics tells us that that we're all connected anyway, you know. I I personally do find it quite uh challenging doing it online um because I like to, I like to have that interaction to look into people's eyes to see people's faces. Um, and my my sight isn't that great, so the the little um, thumbnails I can't really see people's faces very well. I can only see mine on the big screen, so um, <laughs> I guess I could put my glasses on. But <laughs> um, but what I was going to the main point I was going to make is that there's there's a transmission that happens. That's the word I like to use. That something beyond us that is encoded somehow into the storytelling into the stories and i i feel also into the land and that's why bringing that element in of connecting to the landscapes connect it doesn't have to be a specific location but just being in nature it's like we we connect to something which we then storytelling is like meditation you're not thinking about other stuff you're not thinking about your shopping list or your bills or anything you're just present in the moment when you're telling a story and so is everybody else so it's like a big group meditation you're all coming into the moment with a good storyteller anyway the power of that and what can be transmitted to each other through that experience is is really really healing and yes community building connecting and co connection is is the key thing for sustainability of humanity on this planet <laughs> thank you thank you thank you so much so yes on that note of healing community and the building of bridges i think we're going to wrap up today's session thank you so much to everybody who's joined us online and everybody who's joined us in person we had a lovely time sharing stories and listening to them i'm going to be stopping the recording now